guys. My name is Debbie. And I'm Paul. We are pastors of the Haven Church in New Jersey. We're so glad you're here. Uh, we at the Haven believe that we exist to create a safe haven for people to experience Jesus. Our team has put together these videos to help you on your spiritual journey, to bring encouragement, strength, to keep your eyes on the Lord as you walk through the challenges of life. Now, these are meant to be supplemental to your personal relationship with God. And of course, it's very important, according to scripture, to have a home church. If you live in the New Jersey area and would like to be part of the Haven Church, be sure to check the links below so that we can connect with you. We're so glad you're here. Enjoy. Enjoy. Welcome back. Good to see you. Glad you are with us there in another electronic service. Those of you watching from home or wherever, those of you watching at the viewing party, great to see you, great to have you, and of course, our live studio audience. Give it up, guys. Come on. Yep. We have our resident heckler in the front row, so, uh, you know, we're just going to have fun with that tonight, I'm sure. You know, one thing about being a part of any live activity, whether it's here at the Union Firehouse or in the Haven Journey, is we always believed how important it is to have a warm, welcoming atmosphere. They say the environment you walk into, whether it's a church or a business or a home, the environment really helps make us feel either comfortable or possibly uncomfortable. Now, when I was a kid and we were going to have company over our house, I grew up a, a preacher's kid, and so company back in the day was a thing. Uh, we'd have guests all the time, missionaries and speakers and like that. And my mom was the greatest hostess ever on the planet. Just She was so meticulous. She just loved it. So what part of her routine to create that environment, of course, she'd make a meal, usually had the sauce going, so the house had that aroma. She'd prepare the table and was very, very careful in setting things just right and would put out little uh, pretty things and all kinds of stuff. She was so meticulous and she got such joy out of it. But the last thing that she would do right before company came, was she would go around the house lighting scented candles. I don't know, maybe some of you do that, but scented candles, the cinnamony kind. Is cinnamony a word? I don't know. Is that actually a word, cinnamony? cinnamony? I don't know. It is tonight because it's in my notes. The, the, she would light it and just have the house be filled with that, that warmth. And I'm told, I don't know if you read this, but I'm told that a result of the last six months with the lockdown, with people being confined to home so much, is that candle sales, scented candle sales, have gone through the roof. People have decided that, you know, they need something to spruce things up at home, so they've turned to candles. And, and I've come across some that are available that I, I just kind of caught my eye. Let me, let me share that with you tonight as we're talking about creating an atmosphere. First of all, I don't know if you've seen these, but McDonald's offers a packet of scented candles. I am not making any of this up, okay? One of them smells like fresh beef. One smells like cheese. Oh, that's got to be great. One smells like ketchup. Now, here's the deal. You buy it as a packet. You are supposed to light them all at the same time, and your house smells like a quarter pounder with cheese. I'm not making that up. All I can say is, no. Herbie, no. Not going to happen in my house. Then, then there's this one. I guess with candles on the rise, they, somebody decided let's try to market toward men, single men in particular. So this is known as the mandal. See what they did there. The candle for men, the mandal. This one supposedly, when you light it, I can't verify this, but it's supposed to smell like, are you ready for it? A dirty hippie. <laughs> what? what? What's happening to our world is what I want to know. Now, I was only a kid in the 70s, but this much I know. I don't want my house smelling like Woodstock, right? I just don't. By the way, sidebar here, one of the members of the Haven Church actually has this candle in his house. I'm not going to mention any names because of pastor confidentiality, but his initials are shags. Okay, that's all I'm going to say. Now, there's also this candle that my daughter actually got. She had this one because when she lived in Nashville for three years, some of her friends decided you're going to be homesick for Jersey. So we're getting you a candle that smells like Jersey. Now, those of us that live here want to know what part of Jersey does this smell like? Is it, is it the North Jersey? Does it, does it smell like that? Maybe it's the central part of the state where the dumps are located. I don't know. We're not sure. Or is it our beloved Jersey Shore? You know? So here's where I'm going with this. Tonight in 
Our next installment in the parables of Jesus, part eight, about the unjust judge and the persistent widow. Jesus is trying to create an atmosphere for his disciples. He's creating an environment. I, I believe in part what Jesus is doing and where we're going in scripture tonight is he's, he's trying to reinforce in their hearts like an internal atmosphere, one that is of comfort, one that is of peace, and one that is of hope. I think Jesus, through the words that we're going to go through tonight, is going to meet them at a place that is going to help them with where they're going. Now, the parable that we're going to go into in Luke chapter 18 tonight is the last sermon Jesus will share before he goes to Jerusalem, gets on that donkey, and heads his way into the city, which we know as the triumphal entry or Palm Sunday. And the week that follows leads up to the crucifixion, the burial, the resurrection. So this is a moment before that, that week that is coming in their lives that they have no idea what's ahead. And yet Jesus sees it and he creates in them through his words that feeling of peace and of hope. Now this, this parable basically touches on uh, two main elements. I'll be honest, I could, I could preach for weeks. I could probably preach a whole series on just this parable, but I'm going to keep it in the, the two most basic elements that I believe Jesus is conveying through this to, to all of us. And those two eternal truths are this. Be persistent in prayer and trust God. And you might be saying, well, Paul, that is so basic. Every Christian knows that. It's so rudimentary. Here's what I contend. That human nature needs to be reminded of the basics every now and then. Amen. Case in point, how many times in the last six months have we read these words, wash your hands? <laughs> we grew up as kids being told, wash your hands. But now all of a sudden, we're told to do it for a different reason. Stop the spread of the virus. But it's something so basic, so rudimentary, and yet we're reminded all the time. Why? Because we've gotten away from it, and it's gotten out of control. So it can be with Scripture and the precepts of God. So tonight, we are going to really look at some basics because Jesus thought it was important enough to share with those that followed him closest based on the trouble and the trial that was going to come. You ready? Let's go through this journey. We're going to be in Luke chapter 18. I'm starting with verse number one. And what I'm going to do tonight, if it's okay, rather than read the whole parable, I'm going to walk through it a little section at a time, give you some of the background and explanation. So we'll, we'll kind of take that, that journey tonight together. Verse one says this. One day Jesus told his disciples a story or a parable to show that they should always pray and never give up. Now remember, Jesus knows what's coming, but they don't. And in all of our lives, in these next few moments, it behoove us to listen closely because Jesus knows what's coming. You and I don't. So he is going to share something even tonight that he knows we're going to need. Some comfort, some strength, some hope, some peace, whatever it is. Just as the disciples had no idea what was around a bend, neither do we. So let's listen closely tonight to what he has to say. Verses 2 and 3 say it this way. Here's the parable. There was a judge in a certain city, Jesus said, who neither feared God nor cared about people. A widow in that city came to him repeatedly saying, give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. Okay, background. Judges in those days basically had a mobile court. They had this tent that was basically their courthouse, and they would move from town to town and city to city within the region. And when they came to your area and they'd set up the courthouse and the judge would be inside, people who wanted a ruling on a certain issue or dispute, needed a jurisdiction, a ruling from a judge, they would line up to see the judge. Now, if you had some money, you could bribe the guy at the front of the tent and you'd get in before everybody else. It was an extremely corrupt system. So in that context, we have this woman. And we learned a few weeks ago when Jose preached that women we know were very marginalized in this culture of this day. They were second-class citizens at best. So not only a woman, but she's a widow. And in those days, of course, widows were, were often dismissed. They were overlooked. Uh, they were seen of little value. And certainly she didn't have the money to bribe anybody to get to the front of the line. 
So we pause right here and see. It's something very corrupt, a system very hard to beat. And then there's a woman that Jesus lets us see who is, who is in a desperate situation. She has no voice and she has little hope. But what she has is tenacity. Let me keep going. Verses 4 and 5. The judge ignored her for a while. But finally, he said to himself, I don't fear God or care about people, but this woman is driving me crazy. Now, I want to pause there, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to keep going, all right? I'm going to see that she gets justice because she is wearing me out with her constant request. Let me tell you, I dug into that phrase, wearing me out, basically in the, the language of the day, and it means this. She has taken me down. I'm feeling accosted by this woman. It has the connotation of being almost in a, a boxing ring and getting beat up. Now, she wasn't physically beating him up, but emotionally, because she was so persistent. Here's the way it ends. And the Lord said, learn a lesson from this unjust judge. Even he eventually rendered a just decision in the end. So don't you think that God will surely give justice to his chosen people who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? Now, it sounds interesting. Jesus is not saying God is like an unjust judge. He's giving us what's known as a juxtaposition. He's showing us two things that are opposite, but showing them next to each other so we can see how different they are. You have the unjust judge who only made his ruling because he was exasperated and he could be bribed and he was corrupt. And then you have God who is the judge who is righteous, who is loving, who is kind, who is accessible. So Jesus is saying, if you look at these two, you'll see how good your father is. And then verse number eight of Luke 18 wraps up this way. I tell you, God will grant justice to them quickly. His people he's talking about. But when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on the earth who have faith? He's dealing with these fundamentals, eternal truths, to be persistent in our prayer and to always trust God. I find it so fascinating in all of this that this, the, the characters that Jesus illuminates for us to get the message of God. Now, one of the things about prayer in this particular situation is we have to understand that prayer is not a luxury for the believer. Prayer is not optional for you and I that follow God. Prayer is an absolute necessity. And being consistent in our prayer comes with the blessing and the promise of answers. I can tell you, this woman decided somewhere in her journey that her needs were worth fighting for. The needs that she had were worth pressing through and being almost annoying about. Hey, are we that way? Are your needs worth fighting for in terms of prayer with God? In terms of not giving up? Are there loved ones that need you to be calling out their names? Are there co-workers that need you to be consistent and persistent before God? I say, yes, there must be. Let us not fail in our responsibility. Look what 2 Thessalonians says. Chapter 5, verses 15 and 16. Rejoice always and delight in your faith. Are you happy in your faith tonight? Anybody in the room happy in their faith? Tonight? Anybody at home, are you happy in your faith? When you think about the fact that he gave his son, you accept his son, and eternal life is assured. You should be happy in your faith. And then he ties it to this. Be unceasing and be persistent in prayer. I like that expression. Persistence in our prayer. Think about this. It's a demonstration of our faith in God. And though he may delay in his answers, and though it may not happen in our timing, and though sometimes the answer might be no, he will always act, according to Scripture, justly for our benefit, for our good, and that he will be glorified. Persistence in prayer. Listen, I, I think sometimes uh, we, we fail to understand that prayer means hope. 
Prayer is that connection to the only source that can change lives, change hearts, change the course of history. Prayer means hope. Here's Jesus with those disciples that are going to need hope in about four or five days to come. They're going to be hopeless. They're going to be scared. And he's saying, I'm, I'm giving you this to get it in your heart. It'll, it'll create an environment around you. You're going to need hope. We all need hope, especially in these days where the darkness, although lifted some, still seems to be so oppressive, doesn't it? Here's what I believe persistence in prayer can be defined as. It's the demonstration of of faith in the character of God and the chronology or the timing of his actions. Let me simplify it this way. Persistent prayer is faith in who God is and trusting in his timing. It's important that we know who God is because the more we know him, the more we will trust him. Think about your own life. It would be foolish to give your PIN number and the ATM card to a stranger, wouldn't it? But you might give it to your spouse or your significant other. Why? Because you trust them. It'd be foolish to give the keys of your house to a total stranger, trusting in someone you don't know. But you'd give it to some family member. Of course, well, some family members, maybe not all of them. I, I, I know you're out there. But... This is the point, even with our relationship with God. It, it is so important and vital. We get to know Him more because the more we know Him and the more we love Him, the more He earns our trust and the more we will cast our cares on Him. You talk about a life filled with peace and comfort and hope. That's the life. This verse in Hebrews 11.6, I'm going to read it in the Amplified Version. It just blows up some words and, and really makes it understandable. But without faith, it is impossible to walk with God and to please Him. For whoever comes near God, and that would be mostly in prayer, must believe that God exists, number one, and that He rewards or there's a benefit, a payoff, to those who earnestly and diligently seek Him. This is, this is the key to keeping that flow of, of trust with God. It is believing He's there, availing ourselves of the blessing of connecting with Him through prayer, and then allowing Him to reward or to answer and to bless, and then ultimately we draw closer to Him. Now the benefits of that are eternal. The benefits of that build something beyond this life alone it is it is vitally important that we know god i'm going to share some scriptures tonight that might open your understanding reconnect you with who he is maybe you've gotten a little bit out of touch with that maybe maybe part of all that's happening in your life and, and you're you, you know he's there and you you believe he's there but you kind of maybe forget exactly the heart of God let's let's look at some scripture because again knowing him will lead to trusting him implicitly I love this in Psalm 103 13 just as a father loves his children so the Lord loves those who fear and worship Him with awe-filled respect and deepest reverence. When you hear that word fear in Scripture, that's what it means. That deepest reverence, that, that awe-filled respect. God is saying tonight, you're my child. You parents, think about how you are with your kids. It's, it's wonderful to me that in the past uh, six or seven months in the Haven Church, we've had a baby boom been a whole bunch of babies born to couples in the Haven Church. I, I regret that through the lockdown and other things, I've not been able to hold each one of them, but I've reached out to them and we've been in contact. And I, I see in those parents through our communication just the hearts that are almost going to explode with love and joy. Can I tell you, your good, good father feels that about you. Think about it. As a father loves, deeply loves, Heart overflowing with joy and love. As a father does that for his children, so your father does for you right now. You say, yeah, but I've messed up. What kid hasn't messed up? God still loves you, just as a parent still loves and cares for their children. 
How about this one? I love it in Isaiah 49, 16. This is God speaking, and he says, See, I have written your name on the palms of my hands. Think of that metaphor. Think of that picture. Imagine, if you would, no disrespect, but imagine your name is tattooed on God's palm. It's not going away. It's there. And every time you have interaction with God, he hears your voice, he sees your face, and he knows your name. That name is all before him, ever before him. No matter how far you drift, your name is on the palm of his hands. He knows you. He loves you. You say, yeah, but he's got millions of followers. How is that possible? I don't know. It's supernatural. But he said, individually, when you talk to him in prayer, you are the most important thing at that moment. He is connected to you personally. That's the God that says, be persistent in prayer and trust me as you keep coming back time and time again. Think of the love of that God right now to you in your life. Let me give you another one. I love this in 1 Peter. Chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. So humble yourself under the mighty power of of God. Let me tell you, going to God in prayer is a form of humility because we are admitting we can't do it alone. We are admitting that He is great and we are small. We are admitting that without Him, we have nothing. We can do nothing. It is is an act of humility and God blesses that. So humble yourselves under His hand and at the right time, He will lift you up in honor or bring that blessing. And then he says in verse 7, Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares for you. Listen, knowing God tonight, you know how much he cares for you right now? You know, he is inviting you to bring all that burden. He's inviting you. I've often said of the Haven Church, don't leave your cares and sins outside. Bring them in. Put him at Jesus' feet. He's the only one that can help us, that can lighten the load. I don't know if this ever happens in your home. You ever ever have a spouse come home and you're you're just kind of wiped out and they want to talk to you about their day and you just don't want to hear it. It's never happened in our home. It never has. Where you just say, you know, I'm, I'm exhausted. I, I'm not in a very good mood. And you don't invite them to bring all their cares and worries to you. But isn't it beautiful? God says, no matter, wherever, bring them all. For he cares enough not to just listen, but to help us, to strengthen us, and to take some of those loads off us. So that we can walk in greater freedom. I'm telling you, that's the God who says, know me tonight. And as you know me, you will trust me. And I will bring such comfort and peace to your heart. Notice that that scripture says the right time. Ooh, that's a tricky one, isn't it? That's a tricky one. Even in the parable of this persistent widow she had to keep going back time and time again just as she didn't know which time was going to be the breakthrough time sometimes neither do we but at the right time the God who loves us the God who has promised to absolutely be that source he will bring the answer I I think sometimes we lose heart because we really don't understand God's timing You know, he said, my ways are not your ways. We know that scripture, most of us. But grasping it, when there's a delay, when we say, God, I need need the answer now. We need that breakthrough now, and yet it doesn't come. I've experienced that as a pastor of a church. God, why aren't you breaking through? Why isn't this door opening up, Lord? Why? But the walk of faith says, even though the timing might not be mine, I trust you, God. I trust you because I know you. Because I look back and I see how faithful you've been. Because I know even though I thought you were late, oh, how many times I realized the timing problem was on my side. And even if he closes that door for good, he redirects in a way that is for our eternal benefit and blessing. Let me illustrate it this way, the timing of God, and then I'll wrap this up. If you've had kids or been a part of a family, you've probably taken a road trip at some point. Um, I grew up with 
four other siblings, so you know, you get, you get all of us piled in the car there, and we didn't go on plane trips, we went in car rides, and, and even as a dad, you know, it'd be me, Debbie, and Amanda, my daughter, and we'd, we'd occasionally go on these trips and take, take different uh, road trips, and at the time, uh, we had, a, I can think of when Amanda was little, uh, we had a minivan, don't judge me for that, Herbie, I'm telling you, it wasn't my choice, all right, she made me buy that thing. Anyway, we're in the vehicle, let's just put it that way, and we're heading for like maybe a seven or eight hour journey, we're going on a vacation we got Amanda all pumped up she's in the back she's got her video she's got her game she's got her stuff and we're not even out of town and she says these words that every parent has heard at some point are we there yet (laughs) we've gone like six blocks no baby we're not there yet but man this is gonna be great I'm all upbeat and happy we go about another 30 minutes dad are we there yet yeah, not yet, baby, not yet, but soon, all right? Watch your movie, read your book, it's going to be there. About another 20 minutes, are we there yet? No, we're not there yet. And then finally, I'd say something like, we're almost there, only five hours to go. <laughs> but I wonder sometimes if we need to see God as the one who's at the wheel of our lives, who's steering our lives. You see, as her dad, I I knew we'd get there, and I knew when we'd get there. Oh, she'd be so happy. It'd be so worth it. And all she had to do was just relax and trust me. Now, I wasn't mad that she was asking me these questions, but at some point, she had to just sit back and rest. She had to stay in her seat, keep her seatbelt buckled. Don't jump out because that's going to make things worse. So I'll tell you tonight, trust God who's at the wheel of your life. He knows where the destination is. He knows how long it's going to take. Many of us get impatient. Again, it comes back to that trust factor. So I would say tonight, just just don't give up. Just don't give up. I think so many of us, with all that's happened in the last six plus months, many of us feel stuck. Many of us feel like we've gotten bogged down. I, I know. I see some of your posts. I pray for you. I text you. We communicate. I, I sense it. I feel it. How could we not? Uh, it, kids were supposed to go back to school. And now they're still home. And how are we adjusting through that? It is. It has taken its toll. And I think because of that, for some of us, it's taken our joy and maybe our spark and maybe our, our tenacity. Well, tonight, through the words of Christ and the, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, I'd inspire you. Get back in that thing. Get back in the race. Stay in that relationship close with God. Do a little more to get to know him and trust him more and be persistent in your request to him and that that constant relationship with him reaffirm your trust in God before the answer comes reaffirm your belief that he only wants best for you confess that tell him that God I don't understand all of this but I know one thing You've never failed me yet. I'm going to leave you with a scripture that is very, very well known. Again, it's good to come back to the basics. It's found in the Old Testament of the book of Proverbs, chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. You guys know it, but I'm going to read it from the Amplified and just let the Lord talk to you. Somebody might want to take your phone out, take a picture of the screen right now. You might want to take a note of this because if you don't know it, if you've not read it recently, you need to. You know God, and then you will trust God. Listen. Trust and rely confidently on the Lord with all your heart. And do not rely on your own insight or understanding, but in all your ways, know and acknowledge and recognize Him. And He will make your paths straight and smooth, removing obstacles that block your way. That's our God tonight. (laughs) That's his word. That's his promise. Jesus, as he shared this parable that they would be persistent and not fail in their faith and not fail in their prayer and not fail in drawing closer to God, so he says to all of us tonight, trust in me with all your heart. If you've got some ground to make up, Start right now. Talk to him. Pull your heart out to him. And feel him drawing you back into the closeness of his presence. Let me close in prayer tonight. Father, your faithfulness again 
is an overwhelming and wonderful thing. What a blessing that through all these ages and all these years, you still talk to us through this wonderful, live, inspired word of God called the Bible. Jesus, thank you for having compassion on your disciples then and tonight, that you would talk to us and share with us and, and, and inspire us into a place where we could once again have that hope and that peace and that comfort. Lord, I pray for that one that is so troubled right now, that is absolutely feeling bogged down like in the mud. Lord, by your Holy Spirit, lift them up above that place. Lord, let their heart be lifted high tonight through the inspiration of the Word of God and give them the peace that goes beyond our understanding. Let them commit your Word to their heart that it may bring fruit in their lives. Keep your people safe in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the worship team is going to do a song here in a minute. And it ties in perfectly to where we're at. So don't run away. Don't turn off. Don't tune off. Listen to it. Let God talk to you and, and, and settle in this word of God. I love one part of it that says, this is my confidence. You've never failed me yet. Let God talk to you. Let God continue to minister to you. We're here for you. I love you. I'll see you soon.
sing that bridge again. Hey guys, I'm so glad you were able to join us. If the Haven has been a blessing to you, maybe you'd want to consider being a financial supporter. We're 100% self-funded. Uh, there are a few ways to do it. You can download our app. You can do it through our website. You can mail in a check to the PO box that is listed. Uh, we're just in this thing together. We need you. We love you. I will see you soon.